Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Judith Alexander. I'm proud to serve on the Treasurer's Women's Advisory Council. I'm also the chair of an organization called the North Avenue District. And I want to thank you. I want to welcome you uh, to the Illinois State Treasurer's Women's History Month celebration. Thank you all for being here. Our MC this afternoon is Ms. Evelyn Holmes. Evelyn Holmes is a general assignment reporter for ABC 7 News. She came to the station in May 2003 from Chicago Chicagoland Television News, where she was a weekday news anchor. Evelyn has worked in Chicago broadcasting for the past 14 years. She started as a CLTV traffic reporter over 20 years ago. She doesn't look that old. Uh, then served as a weathercaster, general assignment reporter, fill-in news anchor, and weekend news anchor. Before moving to television, television, she was part of both the Bob Collins and Spike O'Dell shows on WGN Radio and has served as fill-in host on WVON AM. Evelyn is a Chicago native and a graduate of Northwestern University. Go Wildcats! She is a member of both the Chicago Association and the National Association of Black Journalists. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Evelyn Holmes. I was just saying, it, it's, it's warm, right? And we shouldn't be complaining about that, right? No, I just have to tell you, I have to put these glasses on because once I had my babies, I can't see nothing. And, uh, okay, all right. Everybody excited? I'm excited to be here. I'm excited and I'm happy. This is always such a wonderful celebration. Always so wonderful. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the Yes, you all may be seated. Thank you again to the National Women's Veterans United Color Guard and St. Sarah Kingsbury for that amazing rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. We gotta give you another round of applause. That is so, you know, Sarah, I've always said, you sing so well that you make me think I could sing. 
which we know I cannot. But you inspire that, that kind of uh, positive nature in me. So thank you again. We appreciate that. We need to recognize uh, uh, dignitaries, and I mean by some of the other dignitaries. Obviously, as far as I'm concerned, we're all dignitaries here, you all especially. We want to make sure we recognize special guests this afternoon, Honorable Cynthia Cobb, judge of the Illinois Appellate Court. Okay. We have Tasha Williams, Christina Chin, from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Where are my girls? Every year, right? Right, right. okay, all right. Old friend of mine, Harold Rice, who is the Community and Economic Development Association of Cook County. Harold, where are you? Put your arm up. There you are. There you are. Okay. James Robachewski, who is with the Polish Roman Catholic Union of America. All right. Thank you, James, for being here. I appreciate you, and I hope I didn't uh, mess up your name too much. If not, it, I would have given you a tour of Channel 7, so you probably should have said I messed it up, but I did not. And Anna Valencia. Where's our clerk? Hey, there she is. Okay. You snuck in on us. What's up with that? At least I usually get a heads up. At least she's not running from me. You know, usually the politicians kind of like to go the opposite direction of me, but you know, I keep changing my perfume and it never works. Thank you for the laugh. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. This is a tough crowd. It's hot and uh, I'm working here, okay? I'm working here. All righty. Anyway, um, I need to introduce a man who is instrumental in making sure that women, their history and their successes, as well as their sheroes, are celebrated and acknowledged. I'm talking about our state treasurer, Michael Frerichs. He's first elected, hey Mike. <laughs> I'm embarrassing him now, but you know, we have a special bond, it's okay. First elected in November 2014, you all may say, what does the treasurer do? Well, he does a lot. His office does a lot. They invest money on behalf of the state and the local unions, uh, units of government. The treasurer also believes in providing individuals with the tools they need to invest in themselves. And that's part of what today is about, right? Acknowledgement and investment in ourselves, not just as women, but our families and those we love. He does this by encouraging savings programs for college and trade schools, which is increasingly important. How many of us weren't told when we were growing up that education was the key? That once somebody gave you some knowledge, they could never take it away from you, right? Um, also, and this is why I like the treasurer as well, beyond being a nice guy and having me here every year, which makes him really intelligent. Um, it's about increasing financial education among all ages. Think about it. You know, I want to raise my daughters to be people who are folks that are contributing members of society, but I also want to teach them how to work with money. A lot of us are afraid of money, especially as women. We're not comfortable talking about money. The treasurer believes in that financial education, and it should start young and continue and continue. He believes that this removes barriers so you can provide a secure retirement. And he also believes in protecting residents from these predatory companies that know people are uncomfortable talking about money and finances and want to take advantage of them, especially when they're in a circumstance where they feel like they're desperate for whatever hope they can get. The treasurer's office also actively manages, here we go, approximately 28 billion. I know folks that can't manage 100 bucks. The investment returns are significant. For every dollar spent to run the office, he nets 28 for the state's residents. Let me say that again. Every dollar spent nets 28. That's a hell of a return on your investment, is it not? It's okay, you can, he's trying not to, he's not under to smile. He's doing a good job, it's just, you know. Born in downstate Gifford, graduated from Yale University. I almost went to Yale, but I went to Northwestern instead. We were talking about it, and I actually paid tuition. I didn't like pay to, okay, never mind. <laughs> row, row, row your boat. All right, okay, it's, a hum it's humor. It's hot and it's humor. He was elected to the Champaign County Board, served as Champaign County Auditor, and was a volunteer firefighter, which I find very impressive. In 2006, Mike was elected Illinois State Senator, representing East Central Illinois. 
currently serves as vice chairman of the National Association of State Treasurers, Legislative Committee, as well as uh, trustee on the State Board of Investment. He lives in Champaign with his daughter, Ella. Ella's out there somewhere. Ella's here. Wave, Ella. Please join me in welcoming the treasurer. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me here today. We choose to have this celebration here in the rotunda of the James R. James R. Thompson Center because we want people to hear the accomplishments of these awardees, of these women. We want to let the sunshine in. But we're letting a lot of sunshine in right now. It is hot up here. So uh, pretty soon I'm going to be sweating through this suit. These women will be glowing, sparkling. I'm going to try and keep my remarks brief. I told them all upstairs that I would thank them for coming here today. We're acknowledging the accomplishments they've made in many different fields. They've reached pinnacles in their fields. But I don't believe that every young woman sees opportunities in many different fields. And that's why I thank them for coming here today, because I brought my daughter here today. She so hates to miss school, right? To see this, we also are glad to see other young women here today, but we want to see that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. There are no male fields or female fields. There's just success in different fields, and these women exemplify that. One area where there's not been a lot of female faces has been on corporate boards. Now, as the state's chief investment officer, we've made an effort. We've joined in the 30% coalition trying to get more women onto corporate boards. We don't do that just so that young women can see examples of women on boards. We do that because we know we get a better return on our investment. We know that diverse boards, boards with men and women, outperform homogenous men-only boards. And my job as chief investment officer is to maximize returns. These are some of the things we've done, taking principles that we believe and use them to do a better job. It's part of the reason why we get such good returns, because I have such a great team, a diverse team that helps make this all happen. So if it looked like I wasn't enjoying the things said about my office, it's because they're not all done by me. They're done by my staff, who is standing around us all here today. So I want to thank them. I want to thank the awardees for joining us here today. And I will now sit down so that we don't have to bake any longer. Thank you for being here. That's all right. No problem. No problem. No problem. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with Mike's kind of sometimes. Um, Ada Tong, who is uh, here for uh, State Rep. Ma, where are you, Ada? Thank you for coming today. We appreciate you. We want to make sure we acknowledge everybody. That's why I like this so much, because, you know, it, it, it gives us an opportunity to acknowledge people that often I think we see but aren't always acknowledged. You know, that's really, really important. Sometimes, the one thing about the awardees here is that these are women who are not seeking the limelight. These are women who are going about their everyday lives trying to make everybody else's life better. They're not looking for a television camera. They're not looking for an attaboy. They're simply using and following that moral compass that's right in here that says, look, I'm going to do what's right. I know I want to be treated well. I know I want opportunity. So let's get to it and meet these amazing women. Our keynote speaker is Diane Latiker. I know you've heard the name. You're trying to figure out where I hear that. Well, she's a community activist and the founder of the nonprofit Kids Off the Block. All right? Which provides residential activities and educational opportunities for young people. Now, as a teenager, here's her story, all right? A lot of times, my grandmother used to say to me all the time when she was alive, she'd say, listen, you know, believe nothing of what you see and only half of what you hear, or something like that. Anyway, 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 this is the point. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, see, they working it for me. Man, thank you. Anyway, this is my point. People don't get to this place without being tested. They don't get to this place 
without having experiences. So when they speak from the heart, they speak from their heart. As a teenager, Diane dropped out of high school, worked in construction, and as a cosmetologist. She is the mother of eight children. Eight, God bless you, I've got two and I wanna pull my hair out. Would you like two more? Okay, just asking, just you know, throwing it out there. I'll pay. And 13 grandchildren. How is that possible when you're only 35? Wow, okay, you're looking good, that's good DNA. Uh, she did eventually earn her GED. When her eldest daughter became a teen, she began to worry that she would get involved in gang activity. She suggested, her mother suggested that she do something to help teens in the neighborhood. This is a way to try to help her own, but she figured, hey, I'm not the only mom have, have struggling with this type of thing, right? So what she did was she turned her own home into a community center. Can you think of anything more selfless than that? To say, listen, I'm, come on here where you can be safe. Come on here where you can have supervision. She sold her personal household items. This is the thing. Think about the thing you cherish most that you wear, a ring, a necklace, a, I don't know, a car. Think about it. She sold her personal household items and opened her home to these kids from 12 to 24. Now, you know some of those kids are pretty rough. Those are some of the kids that when you see them walking, you cross the other side of the street to try to avoid eye contact. Let's be real. She said, come to my home. She let them know that she was available 24-7. And in about three months, she had 75 kids come into the house on a regular basis. Latica started Kids Off the Block because she felt that her community was plagued by violence hopelessness and negativity. You know, I do a lot of nasty stories, hard stories in the neighborhood. One of the things I know is when you lose hope, it's almost over. You can never lose hope. And she brings hope. She offered young people homework help, mentoring, activities, and above all, a safe place. You know, my mother always told me, you know, a real friend does. A real friend helps you the way you need help, not the way they need to help you. This is what she does. So starting out with 10 kids from the neighborhood 14 years ago, kids off the block now service and has serviced over 3,000 participants. Wow. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Diane Lattaker. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank Illinois Treasurer. I'm not going to say because I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brian Eccles and Devontae Stewart. Congratulations to all the honorees. I love everything that they're doing. Um, I have, I do, I have four boys and four girls. Um, I have one at home. I wrote three speeches, let me tell you all this, last night. I tore them all up because I knew when I got up here I was going to get emotional and I wasn't going to read them right, so <laughs> I'm going to just tell you from my heart. There's a flawed individual standing up here right now. I, was a, I got pregnant at 16, I got married at 16. I had six kids with my first husband, three girls and three boys. And then I got married again and I wanted to go get my GED, at least try to get part of an education because I had worked all my life since I was 13 years old to help my mom. When I got told by my mom, Diane, those kids like and respect you, I didn't want to hear it. I was 46 years old. I only had my last child at home, Aisha, and I wanted her to graduate from high school and go to college. And I would be free to go fishing. I love fishing. <laughs> Somehow or another, I prayed about it for three days, and a higher power said, no, you're going to do this. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. I talk my big stuff, you know. <laughs> but I went to that window, and I saw my daughter and her friends outside. And I called them up to me, and I said, 
what do y'all want to be when you grow up? And they started jumping up and down like little kids. They were teenagers, saying, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, rapper, singer, basketball player. And I said to myself, but I'm only a mom. I don't have degrees. I don't have money. I can't help everybody else's kids. And I called them into my house, having no idea about a program or EIN number. And I sat down with these kids, Aisha's friends, and I thought I knew them because they grew up with my daughter. I didn't know them at all. I started listening to them. The gangs were recruiting the boys. All of them were failing in school. Where Evelyn talks about I sold stuff, the first thing to go was my husband's television. That did not go well, as you might figure out. It was that big old giant TV that everybody had. And he had a lazy boy. And when he came home from work, he wanted to take a bath, eat his dinner, and get in that lazy boy and watch that TV. Well, I had begged him for two weeks. And then one day, I couldn't take it no more. And I sold it when he went to work. And when he came back home, it was not nice. It was the first time he said he would divorce me. And uh, there were many more. By the way, he is still with me. It'll be 35 years this year. <laughs> but it was pretty tense. I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted to help the kids with homework. I sold the TV. I got $600. I bought used computers and used printers so I could help them with homework. I had not a clue that other kids that I did not know would come knock on my door, like 13-year-old Maurice. He knocked on the door. He said, are you Miss Diane? I said, yes, I am. He said, I want to change my life. I said, you have no life. You said you're 13? You haven't done anything. He said, yes, I have. I was robbing people. I was beating up other boys. And I said, really? And I invited him into my home and helped him. He's on a CNN video with me if you ever want to see him. All he wanted to do was play football. <laughs> so that's why he was doing all that stuff. There were a lot of other kids that started coming to my house. They were sitting on my porch day and night. Mind you, I'm 46 years old. I asked God, why did he wait so long to give me a passion? And it came to me. I wasn't ready. If I didn't know what I knew today, I probably wouldn't be doing it. I came in it backwards. If I didn't know what it took to help people with all the processes and all the paperwork and all the reports, and I probably wouldn't have did it. But because I came in it backwards and I came in it not knowing, I just wanted to help the kids in my neighborhood. And once I go and start bugging my alderman every day until he threw me out, not literally, he just said, is Diane Latiker out there? I'm not coming out there. I bugged him. I went to every meeting. I tried to learn everything I could learn to help these kids. And then it started being 50 kids in my house every day and night. There were homeless kids, kids who wanted to get out of gangs. There were kids who wanted to just go back to school. And they thought this lady on Michigan could help them. And I didn't want to disappoint them. And I wasn't anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't know all this stuff. But once I figured out what they needed, I just started bugging the people that I thought could do it. I started asking people. That's all I wanted to do was help the kids in my community. In the span of three months, it was 75 in my house day and night. That's the third time my husband threatened to divorce me because they were going into his bedroom. He couldn't get no rest. The neighbors were calling the police on me at night. The kids, all of them couldn't fit in my three-bedroom apartment. Two gang leaders came to my house and threatened me. I had to have them arrested. My van was shot up. I wound up in elementary school with the doors closed, and two gang leaders came in with 245s going to shoot each other. And I got 75 kids in there with me. And the only thing I could think about was to grab one of them in the collar and scream at him to tell him to drop the guns. And then later on, after it was over, after the detectives came, I almost passed out because I said to myself, what are you doing? I had no clue. I just knew I couldn't stop. I told my husband, you support me or that's it. I didn't want to lose my husband. Four of my kids didn't like it. They said it was too dangerous and they didn't want to come to my house. But I couldn't stop. I was
was on the brink of losing everything. I am so sorry. I try to do these speeches without getting emotional. But when I think about it, when I think about that, I could have just easily walked away. It was so easy, and it still is. I used to quit every day because the Latin Kings were around the corner and they surrounded my house one night in black hoodies with guns. Because the BDs said that I was a traitor and they wanted to do something to my family and they were gonna throw Molotov cocktails in my house. And I had to get the FBI involved. I could have easily walked away. But every time I thought about that, one of the boys would come, you know how God set you up, how he nudged you? Every time I would think about quitting, a boy or a girl would come in my house, say, Miss Diane, if that door wasn't open, I'd be dead in jail. And I couldn't turn my back. My kids say, Ma, you can move, it's too dangerous. But where would I go? Those kids know I'm there, their brothers and little sisters are now coming up. They know I'm there. I can't just walk away. At 46 years old, I found my passion. I've lost over eight young people to violence. I couldn't save them, I tried. I still can't stop. It's, it'll be 16 years this year. I'm 62 years old. My husband says I need to go sit down somewhere. He means well, but I can't go sit down. This is what I do, this is my life. These young people that I look at every day that come knock on my door and say, can you help me? That's what I do. And I'm gonna reach out to one of you or whoever else I can reach out and I'm gonna bug you to death. If I can't do it, somebody's gonna do it because their lives are worth it. Their lives are worth it. Our communities deserve better. Our children deserve better. And I'm just one. When you look around, there are so many of us who are doing this, who are helping. Don't forget about us. I'm in Roseland on the far south side. Anytime you want to come see me, just drive down 116th Street. I'm right there. You'll see a memorial to young people killed by violence because I wanted to shock my community. We're losing a generation to violence. And no, it's not normal. So please, remember the young people, those ones that you're so afraid of, those ones that you see on the news. Somebody out there is caring about them, and I'm one of them. Thank you. Wow. Wow is right, right? Mm. So what were we talking about before? We we're talking about, you know what? You said it, flawed folks. Folks that are just doing what they think is the right thing to do, that are driven and led to do that, almost like a compulsion. It's like you're breathing, this is what they do. So I would implore you, think about one thing you can do nice for somebody, and then just do it. Don't look for nothing in return. Don't matter how they act. Just do it. Just do it. God works through people. God works through people. And it goes through your heart. Keep your heart kind and soft. That way, God can work through you, but he can also work through others to help you. It's just a cycle. Thank you for that. Wow. That's some powerful stuff, huh? We want to honor these incredible women who are sitting up here on this stage. Let us start with the Treasurer's Outstanding Service and Business Award. It's being presented to Jackie Robinson Ivy. Now, <laughs> these girls up here are some bad girls, I'm going to tell you. But Jackie, boy, 
She's the senior vice president of Northern Trust Company, Chicago. I wish I'd known her when I needed my mortgage. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, um, and she'd probably say no. No, get another job. Get some more, get some more income and we'll talk to you later. No, she wouldn't. She's very kind. No, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm not going to say, please don't read all, but I need to read some of this because I need folks to know how wonderful you are. She is also the, in addition to being, and let me make sure because I don't want to step on it, senior vice president she is also a public affairs officer in the Corporate Compliance and Special Programs Group. Now, for you all that don't understand corporate speak, she makes sure that folks are doing right by folks no matter how you look. She makes sure that the products that the bank is selling, are they're selling them properly to the right people and following the rules. She joined Northern Trust back in 1988 served in various capacities, and was on the promotion track. I should say 1988, sorry about that, Jackie. She is a financial expert who has always given back. She's a member of the Northern Trust United Way leadership team and has been for 18 years. Do you see a theme here? It's in them, that seed that says, I want to help other people. So her success, is our success. She's a member of the Illinois Banking Association's Government Relations Board, so she understands how things work. She's a member of the Advisory Council for the Northern Trust UNCF Walkathon and is a past recipient, past recipient of the Chairman's Diversity Award. They don't give that to everybody. And this is the one thing I find most impressive. She is active in the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center, which serves children who are victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, those who witness abuse. You ever heard of ACEs? That's a result. Adverse childhood experiences, you see someone getting punched in the face, it affects you in your mind. And other serious mistreatment. Jackie's a giver. So let's give her something, our thanks and our gratitude. Jackie, please step forward. So good afternoon, everyone. Oh, the picture first? Oh, OK. I'll be very brief. Um, I, I saw Jeannie Adams uh, give the, uh, she came through with the color guard. Is she still here? She is, I have to ask Jeannie to stand before um, I say anything. Jeannie is part of the reason that I am at Northern Trust. She was, um, and I think my stats are right, the first African-American female vice president, right? Yeah, in the trust department. And Jeannie was with Northern for a lot of years. I don't know how many, but but I am because of her, so it's good to see you, Jeannie. Thank you so much for being here. So, and to uh, City Clerk Valencia, I did not see her. I, so I thank you for being here. Um, so to the treasurer, I'd like to think he's my friend. I call him Mike Frericks. And to the deputy treasurer in his absence, Rodrigo Garcia, Barb Chalco, um, Brian Eccles, uh, there are so many, Deborah Graham, there are so many people from the office that I've had the opportunity to work with. Thank you for this honor. I've enjoyed working with the office and I hope it doesn't make me sound biased, but I am. We at Northern Trust have a wonderful relationship with this group and we're grateful for every opportunity you give us. I'm honored and humbled to be in the presence of all these wonderful women. Every time I'm asked about receiving, receiving an accolade or an award, I'm literally shocked. When Barb phoned me, I really thought she was calling me to invite me to come hear someone speak for Women's Month, as I've done many times before. I'm of the opinion that if we are focused and working hard, you don't usually stop to notice the flowers that are being pinned on you. Barbara Jordan once said, don't call for black power, don't call for white power, don't call for green power for that matter, but call for brain power. If I had my way, a dear friend would say I live a Pollyanna type life, I would ask that all criteria be based on our ability, but let me pause parenthetically to say that the bar needs to be set fairly from the outset as far as access is concerned. And from the outset, I mean when the doctor says it's a girl. Notice I did not say it's a boy. 
And then all things being given, being equal, we access ability much like that of the orchestra auditions. If you don't know how orchestras are judged, they don't get to hear the click of the heels or a clearing of a throat to determine sexuality. All they hear is the instrument being played. What if we lived in America, in an America, in a world like that? One thing I know for certain, we as people must be willing to accept ourselves as being different from one another, and we must acknowledge the world we live in. See my ethnicity, see my feminism, see and acknowledge the differences that I make from you. Let's embrace one another rather than judge one another for being different. I'm leery of anyone who says, I don't see color or I don't see sex. I want you to see me. I want to be acknowledged for everything God has given me. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been a part of where I was the only, the only woman, the only African American, just for starters. But on this Women's History Month day, I hope each one of us in this room can consciously make an effort to do better, to lift as we climb, not just as women, and not just to help women, but for men, for that, for that matter, and to make better, to be better for ourselves. If you haven't done so, you've got four more days to do so. Hi, Dale. <laughs> when you see one of your deputy general counsels that you, and who you report to didn't expect to see them in the audience, you stop. In closing, I would like to quote Melinda Gates. She says, when women and girls are empowered to fully participate in society, everyone benefits. I don't know exactly when in the dark ages we became marginalized, but it seems to me that it's just plain common sense. Realistically speaking, think about it. None of us would be here without a woman. Thank you again to the State Treasurer's Office and congratulations to everyone for the reward today. Now, we got a little bit of a late start, so I'm going to let them do that. I'll move this along a little bit, and I apologize if I am a bit verbose today. I just, uh, I get, always get excited about this. Okay. Uh, Treasurer's outstanding commitment to community service is being presented to Dr. Arloa Sutter. The doctor was born and raised in a farm in Iowa before arriving in Chicago's Edgewater neighborhood. She married a pastor and became involved homeless who came to the church door. Now this kind of morphed into the desire to help. She began using a neighborhood or nearby storefront to serve meals and after a while she developed this organization, Breakthrough Urban Ministries. You've heard of that? These, I'm telling you, these are some bad women. They got, they got it going on. It's serving the needs of Edgewater community until it finally outgrew. Now, listen, that tells you that the need is great, right? People, there's need out there. Finally outgrew its space and moved to East Garfield Park. Since then, they've expanded their services. Over the last 27 years, the group has provided shelter for over 11,000 homeless people in Chicago, served over a million meals to homeless adults, supported 850 youth through achievement programs and volunteering. Let us bring to the stage Dr. Sutter. Wow, it's such an honor to be here and to be with these, did you say badass or just bad? Oh, I'm sorry, these bad women. They are, okay, I'm so sorry. They are, they are amazing and it's just wonderful to be in their presence and all of you and thank you, sir, for this great honor. Um, I was at the corner of uh, Milwaukee and Armitage and Western. I think there's like all these three streets come together at the same time. And I noticed a guy in the intersection who stalled out. I don't know if he ran out of gas or what happened, but he was right there and there were cars coming from all directions and I was one of them. And first I was like, why doesn't he get that car out of the intersection? Then I saw him get out of the car, take his foot with his hand on the steering wheel and start pushing. I instinctively wanted to go help. And I, before I could even get out of my car to get to him, there were about 10 people who pushed him through that intersection. That's how I tell my story of what I did. I just started pushing for something because something had to be done. You grew up on a farm in Iowa, you'd get busy. You don't just let things fall apart. 
And so when people were starting to come to our little storefront room and they, and they had these needs, one by one, I was able to find some money to hire somebody who could do what I was doing a whole lot better than I could. And now we have 100 people in East Garfield Park. We live and work there. And we have put together this team of people that does everything from preschool to after school to wraparound services to people without homes to street outreach to people who are experiencing violence as the victims and the perpetrators and de-escalating the retaliation. And I'm just riding on that with gratitude and um, an amazement over what can happen when we just get out of the car and start to push. So thank you for this honor. It goes to the community of East Garfield Park and all the wonderful people and volunteers I get to work with every day. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Our next awardee receives the Treasurer's Commitment in Education Award presented to Dr. Janice Jackson. Now, we've never met, right? No, I don't know. I know somebody that looks like her, but I ain't her. She has been immersed in Chicago Public Schools her entire life. She was a CPS student from Head Start to 12th grade. Began teaching on the South Side at South Shore High School. Served as a principal, a network chief, uh, chief education officer, and now chief executive officer of the Chicago Public Schools, the third largest school district in the nation. Now, I have a special part, uh, place for teachers because my mother's a teacher. Yeah, she knows my mother. She knows my mother, and if she doesn't do something right, my mother gets on the phone. Excuse me, Janice. You don't want my mother, trust me, you do not want my mother calling you. It's not a good thing. Anyway, this is what I love about uh, Janice, is that she's one of those kind of people that comes in and makes things better. Now, one of the things is that she did was, y'all familiar with that? Anybody with a high school student going to selective enrollment or any kind of, uh, go CPS? I'm going through that right now, Kate uh, Jones. We praying, because I believe me, I'm about to pull my hair out. Anyway, she's the driving force behind that. It's the first common application for all CPS and charter high schools, which improved access and equity for all CPS students. You literally can go on there and figure out where you are, what you need to apply for. It's just like one-stop shopping, and as a parent, believe me, I love it. She also did this, which is equally, if not even more important. She propelled CPS students to a record high graduation rate of 77.3%. 77.3% and, and I have to add this in, then we'll go. She supported the graduation requirement that insisted that students have a plan after they graduate so they can prepare in the classroom and move to the next step. It could be trade school, it could be college, it could be junior college, it could be cosmetology school. We're talking about having a plan for maximum success. This is how she thinks. This is the inspiration that she brings. Dr. Jackson, come get your award. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, first of all, I want to extend um, the warmest gratitude to um, our state treasurer, Ferrix, for acknowledging my leadership and also the wonderful and beautiful women who are here with me on this panel. So I wanted to thank you for that. I know you acknowledge uh, leaders uh, based on uh, for African American History Month as well as Women's History Month. And I can't think of a better way to kind of bookend what has really been an extraordinary month, especially for women here in Chicago. We kicked off this school year by, we kicked off this uh, Women's History Month, I should say, of March, by making a declaration to support young women and girls in the city, along with our clerk, uh, Anna Valencia. I have the pleasure, let's give her a big round of applause. I have the pleasure of working with so many elected officials who are deeply concerned about the quality of education and the well-being of kids in Chicago. But I also have people who are standing behind me, recognizing me as an African-American woman leader, and knowing that that may come with some challenges, but it comes with far more benefits. And I can't think of a better way to use my gifts and talents than to educate the next generation of students. We are raising young girls every single day to recognize that there is strength in being a woman, 
Um, as Jackie pointed out, I want you to see me as an African American. I want you to see me as a woman and understand that we are here, we are supposed to be here, and we can do great things. Today, we announced the vision for Chicago Public Schools, a strategic plan that is focused on making sure that our kids have high quality education, that they have the resources that they need, and that we as a district do a better job to restore public trust. It is an honor to serve in this role. I get to be a role model. You couldn't have told me 20 years ago that would be the case, but here I am. And I am here because of everything that Chicago Public Schools and people in a greater community provided me. I want to thank you for coming out today, and it is a blessing and an honor, and I will do my best to represent a woman uh, making history in education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, our next award is the Treasurer's Outstanding Achievement in Workforce and Labor. It's presented to Tabitha Stambau, graduate of Benton High School in Southern Illinois, four-year Air Force veteran. Four-year Air Force veteran. <laughs> Spent nine years as a union laborer, working jobs spanning from asbestos removal or in work and building construction and demolition, highway patching. This is tough work especially for a woman. Trades sometimes are not open as they should be. Repair and new construction, bridge construction, concrete, masonry work. I mean, this is amazing. Using that experience, she didn't just use it to enrich herself. What she did was she said, you know what, I'm gonna get more education and I'm gonna go help other people. She's taking courses in rigging, CPR, first aid, traffic control, landscaping. And, you know, I guess since she gets bored in her spare time, what she decides to do is she uses those hours and puts them back into her community. So she's a regular speaker with Work Zone Safety um, for Driver's Ed. Um, she's a training officer at the U.S. Naval Sea Cadet Corps in uh, Champaign. And she's a regular presenter at IDOT during their Work Safety, uh, Work Zone Safety uh, Awareness Week. She does all this as a member of the Illinois Laborers Locals 477. And get this, she's got three kids on top of all this. She's got two girls and a son who is a member of the Air National Guard and is currently deployed in Iraq. Let's welcome Tabitha. Okay, I'm honored to be here this today. This afternoon, sorry. Don't mind me. And grateful and humbled to receive this award. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Frerich. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, for selecting me to, to receive this award, and a special word of thanks to Lion Vice President and Midwest Regional uh, Manager John Penn uh, for nominating me. I'm grateful to my family and friends for always supporting me and for being here at this special moment. I am blessed to have some of my family with me, JC, Destiny, Jaden, Jason. Um, and she mentioned earlier that my son is currently serving in Iraq. Um, I'm especially grateful for Local 477, uh, my home local, for believing in me and for my Lyuna sisters and brothers who have worked alongside me and have mentored and supported me on this journey. As a woman in construction, I am proud of all that I've accomplished. Um, ANSI certified instructor, uh, Layuna OSHA master trainer as well. Uh, I've seen much change in our industry, and today young girls and women all across the nation look at construction as a career opportunity they have access to. Being a tradesperson, whether it's in the laborers or any other craft, is no longer seen as just a man's job. And I am proud of the role that organized labor in Layuna, in particular, have played in, in this change. May we all continue to work together or nurture, uh, support each other, and to help women grow as dynamic and accomplished leaders, not only in construction, but across all industries. Thank you, very, thank you again for this award. I am very humbled. Thank you. Fantastic. You know, I thought I was going to um, impress Tabitha and told her that I put in my own Nest doorbell. <laughs> and she said, my, isn't that nice for you? <laughs> That's good. Go sit over there. Anyway, all right. Just a little humor there. It actually works, though. I could show you. I'm, I'm really impressed. It works. 
It took me about six hours to get it in, but you know, good things take time. Anyway, uh, Treasurer's Outstanding Service in Leadership Award is being presented to Deputy Commissioner Annette Nance Holt of the Chicago Fire Department. She is, and I'm gonna read this now, I know we got time things, I know that, but I'm, I'm gonna have to, I'm sorry, I gotta do it. She is the first woman to ever serve as the Chicago Fire Department's second in command. Come on now. Now, would you believe that she started her career in corporate America as a tax accountant? Does she look like a tax accountant to you? <laughs> you know, I'd hate to like not, you know, forget a receipt. You know, I'm sorry. Anyway, when her friends started training for the fire academy, so did she. She uh, most recently served as deputy district chief, in the fourth district, which covers the city's west and south sides. Throughout her 29 years on the job, she's witnessed the Chicago Fire Department address several class action lawsuits and deal with the issues of racism and sexism. And she's helped the fire department grow beyond that. Now, many of you know Annette because of what happened with her son, Blair, who was killed in 2007 as he shielded a classmate from gang gunfire on a uh, crowded CTA bus. That's actually how Annette and I met The Blair's uh, death, Nance Holt, Annette, and her dad, uh, who I also know, Ronald, um, became prominent gun control activists and crime victim advocates. Not to mention, just she's just a nice person. Let's bring her up. Thank you, Treasurer Ferrix. Um, you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself because never in my wildest dreams would I think I would be standing up here as second in charge of one of the largest fire departments in America. Um, especially in light of what happened. You know, I could have given up after Blair was murdered and I could have quit the fire department, but I didn't. I stayed. I um, pursued my master's afterwards, and it was the hardest thing to do just to keep going, but I did. Um, I can honestly say without a man or men supporting me, especially in a non-traditional woman's job such as the fire department, and there aren't many of us in there, and there aren't many of us at the top at all, I could not stand here today. Richard C. Ford had a vision of changing the fire department, making it inclusive. Um, bringing in minorities and women, and he chose me to be a second in command. So I couldn't stand here today without a man supporting me and pulling me up and showing me what it's like to do this job. Um, what could I say, and I mean to the young ladies out here, I was told to quit and give up when I came on this job. Never give up. Never let anybody tell you you can't do it because you can do it. And I'm telling you, remember to ground yourself in faith because with God, all things are possible because God has kept me throughout my career. So, and I could not <laughs> get here without God. So just remember that and education is always in play. If you are educated, you position yourself to be in place for that next move. So thank you and God bless you. Fantastic. Y'all didn't know we were going to have church today, did you? You're like, it's only Tuesday. Church should be every day. All right. Thank you, Annette. Wow. All right. Last but not least, the treasurer's commitment as an elected official award goes to appellate court judge Aurelia Puchinski. <laughs> I love her. I've known her for a long time, kind of peripheral. I've watched her. We've done some, it, it's, she's, she's fantastic. She was elected to the Illinois Appellate Court in 2010. Before that, she served as circuit court judge in Cook County for six years. Now, as a trial judge, she heard more than 10,000, 10,000 domestic violence cases. She's particularly interested in the law that affects senior citizens and the disabled. 
and has created a program domestic violence, in domestic violence court to add additional protections and services to senior citizen victims of domestic abuse. These things happen all the time. But she cued in on it and said, you know what? These people need my help. The judge started practicing 43 years ago, law that is, in a neighborhood office that she developed a reputation for pro bono work. Matter of fact, she represented some uh, citizens who sued the Board of Education, sorry Janice, sued the Board of Education um, to keep a local school open. She's like, that was before my time, don't mention me. Um, a case she won in appellate court. We're talking about the legal part here, that's all. Uh, for 12 years, you may remember, served as clerk of the circuit court, remember that? Uh, where two of her major accomplishments were getting child support checks processed in record time. I know that a lot of folks are like that, men and women, like, you know, come on, kids gotta eat. And computerizing courtrooms, it makes it so much easier. I remember when that happened, believe it or not. Native Chicagoan who grew up in a home who, that emphasized community service. She's the daughter of the late Illinois Congressman and Chicago Alderman Roman. Remember him? Legend. Graduated to Paul College of Law. Judge, please receive your award. It is an honor to be here today with all of these lovely women awardees, and I, I'm humbled by their accomplishments. I thank the treasurer, Treasurer Ferrix, for selecting me and my good friend Barbara Chalka for facilitating it. I have been blessed by a lot of firsts in my life. I was the first attorney to bring an infant to court in a little umbrella stroller 10 days after she was born because I was nursing her and I, I couldn't leave her at home. So Becky doesn't remember going to court, but I tell her about it all the time. I was the first attorney to nurse an infant in the Daly Center, and now they have a lactation center. I was the first woman regional counsel of the Small Business Administration the first woman clerk of the circuit court. To get that job, I had to beat Jane Byrne and Ed Verdoliak in the same election, and that was a race to talk about. <laughs> I was the first county elected official to offer flex time my, to my employees, the first to offer a nursing room to new moms, uh, the first person to install youth peer juries in 73 suburban communities and about 12 Chicago P police districts, I was the first elected official to convene a summit of other women elected officials to fight for gun control in Cook County. I was the first judge to establish uh, a program to uh, help senior citizens uh, who are victims of domestic violence. I was the first appellate court justice to recognize that we need a help desk for civil pro se litigants. And I've had all those first in my life, but I must tell you, Treasurer, this is the first time I've been called historic, so I appreciate the honor. Okay. Again, want to congratulate all our awardees, and let's recognize them with one last round of applause. Oh, we need to acknowledge a few people. Judith Alexander, where's Judith? Diane, we need to acknowledge. Sarah, we need to acknowledge as well. Oh, there's, there she is, okay. And the National Women's uh, Veterans United. And also a special thanks to the member of, members of the Treasurer's Advisory Council. Would you stand and be recognized? And then also, um, yes, please. And then, and then um, for the Treasurer's Office, the folks working in his office, would you raise your hands, please? Thank you all again for being here. Thanks for letting me participate in your day as well. Thank you, Treasurer. Everyone, thank you again for coming. Congratulations to all these lovely ladies here. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.